Hi, I'm William Spaniel, and I am a PhD candidate at the University of Rochester, and incidentally, I am on the academic job market for this year. This is my 2014 APSA presentation, Ideology Matters, Policy Bargaining and International Conflict, and this is based off of a paper which is joint work with Peter Bills, who is also a graduate student at the University of Rochester. So what do we argue in this paper? Well, we argue that many international conflicts are fundamentally about policy. We can see this right now with the United States and Russia vying for influence in Ukraine. We can also see this very frequently in civil wars. So think about a region which is seeking autonomy from a centralized government. That centralized government may or may not have strong feelings about this subject matter. Indeed, if we look at militarized interstate disputes, we see that a plurality of them, or 44%, are initiated based off of some sort of policy issue. And we argue that the standard bargaining model of war, essentially what we see in Fear on 1995 and so forth, cannot appropriately model these sorts of policy debates. The reason is that when we use the standard bargaining model of war, what we do is standardize the policy preferences, the ideal points of actors, at zero and one. And by fixing things in that way, we cannot analyze how the interaction changes and how the outcomes change as we alter those policy preferences, or more importantly, as we add uncertainty about policy preferences. So that's our contribution here. We're going to explicitly model policy preferences in crisis bargaining. We're going to see by and large that these results are going to be very similar to what we normally see in the standardized or in the standard bargaining model of war. Indeed, what we'll see is that our model has the Fear on 1995 model as a special case. But things are going to change drastically when we look into situations with incomplete information, where there's uncertainty about one side's policy preference. When we do this, we're going to find situations where war is impossible to avoid, and where war is possible to avoid, we might see inefficient peace result. We're going to see that cheap talk sometimes works. Those incentives to misrepresent don't always have influence here. And we also look at cases where adding uncertainty actually creates more peace. This is something that we're not going to have time to discuss here, but you can find out more about that in the paper. You can check the video description, and I'll have a link to the paper there. All right, so let's start off by trying to figure out what's going on here. Let's model this situation where we're bargaining over policy. We're going to look at a standard ultimatum, a take it or leave it offer. So we have two states, each with different ideal points. So state one has ideal point x hat one, and state two has ideal point x hat two. In an ultimatum, state one is going to offer a policy to state two. State two will accept or reject that policy. Accepting ends the game with that policy implemented, and rejecting leads to war. We have war as a costly lottery here. So state one will win with probability P, state two will win with complementary probability. The winner becomes the dictator of the universe and will be able to choose whatever policy it wishes. And the states are going to pay respective costs C1 and C2 if they fight. Policy-wise, the state's payoffs are the negative Euclidean distance from the state's ideal point. This is the standard stuff that you would see in an American politics paper on ideal points. Essentially, the further you are away from your ideal point, the worse payoff you get. That's all that's saying. Fortunately, I can give you all of these results in nice pictures rather than throwing up a bunch of words on the screen and trying to be able to explain it like that. So picture-wise, what's going on here? Well, we have two different ideal points. We have an ideal point for state one and an ideal point for state two on the real line. We can fix that probability of victory. We can pretend that it is a convex combination between those two ideal points. So it's somewhere in between those two ideal points. And that P there represents the average policy that's going to be implemented if they fight a war. So think about this as state two. If state two fights a war, it expects to see P be implemented, again, in expectation, which means that state two is willing to endure some policy that's slightly to the left of P rather than fight a war because it avoids those costs of war. 
So what we see here in this dashed line is the fact that any policy that is peacefully implemented to the right and going closer and closer to player two's ideal point is preferable to war. And that payoff is going to increase as you move closer and closer to the ideal point, and it's going to maximize at the ideal point. On the other hand, if we move policies further and further to the right of the ideal point, player two's payoff is going to decrease and decrease and decrease. And actually, if you move too far to the right, player two is going to prefer fighting a war to implementing that policy. This tent that I've created is actually very useful. It represents the acceptance set. Any policy on the real line that falls inside of that tent is a policy that state two prefers to war. We can do the exact same thing, analogous, for player one, and we now have state one's acceptance set, so any policy inside of that tent is a policy that state one prefers to war. And lo and behold, what do we see? We see that there is an overlap between these two acceptance sets. That is the bargaining range that we're used to seeing. The costs of war ensure that there is a range of bargain settlements that both prefer to war. So if we're looking at a situation with complete information, we would expect them to settle inside of that bargaining range. But that's not the interesting case. The interesting case is what happens when we add uncertainty. So that's what we're doing now. So instead of player two's ideal point being known, player two could have one of two different ideal points. It could be X, or rather theta two lower bar or theta two upper bar. This is going to be privately known to player two. Player two could either have this low preference or it could have a high preference. State one, meanwhile, only has a prior belief about whether state two is this low type or the high type. And we're going to consider two cases. We're going to look at a situation first where there's no communication allowed between the parties. And then we're going to look at a situation where there is cheap talk. Ordinarily, in the standard bargaining model of war, these two things are identical because of the incentives to misrepresent that normally render cheap talk irrelevant. Here, that's not going to be the case. Cheap talk is going to allow us to come to peaceful terms that we would be unable to otherwise. All right, I'm going to draw a couple of different situations with incomplete information. I go over, or rather Peter and I go over a whole bunch of different combinations of these things in the paper. Only going to do two here in this uh, presentation right now. So in this case, we have state one's ideal point inside of the acceptance set of the low type of player two. What that means is that if state one were to demand its own ideal point, state two as the lower type would be willing to accept it. But notice that state one's ideal point does not fall in the acceptance set of the high type of state two. So this is where we get what is known as the risk return trade-off in these incomplete information bargaining environments. If state one believes that state two is very likely to be the low type, state one is going to demand its own ideal point. It will get peace with the low type, but it's going to get war with the high type. So it's going to be costly in that case, but because it's so rare, state one is willing to run the risk to try to implement its own ideal point. On the other hand, if state two is much more likely to be the high type, state one is going to play it safe and offer an amount that is in the intersection of those two acceptance sets. That ensures that both parties are willing to accept the offer and state one can avoid war. However, here, peace is inefficient. Note that if state two ends up being this low type and we implement a policy that is in the intersection of those two acceptance sets, both the low type of state two and state one would prefer moving the policy position to the left because both of their ideal points are further to the left than the intersection between those two acceptance sets. So peace might work here, but it's going to be inefficient. We can also come up with situations where it's impossible to guarantee yourself peace. So here we have the intersection of those acceptance sets as empty. They do not overlap, which means if state one tries to appease the low type of state two, it's going to fight a war against the high type. And if it tries to appease the high type, it's going to fight a war against the low type. So no matter what state one does here, it's going to be fighting a war with positive probability. Now, what happens when we have communication? Well, we're going to allow for cheap talk here. So before the offer is made, state two is allowed to send a message to state one. Con uh, consistent with cheap talk, we're going to have the message not directly affect payoffs. Rather, any sort of effect in payoffs is going to have to come indirectly from the offer that uh, state one will make to state two. This is the no-win situation from before. With cheap talk, it actually becomes a guaranteed win. 
the low type is going to announce that it's the low type, and the high type is going to announce that it's the high type. All information is revealed, and so state one is now going to make an acceptable offer to the low type and an acceptable offer to the high type. The reason that incentives to misrepresent don't screw up the bargaining environment is that if the low type tries to pretend to be the high type, what's going to result is that state one is going to make an offer geared toward the high type. But if it's geared toward the high type, that is an unacceptable offer to the low type. So the low type actually is perfectly happy revealing itself to state one and getting an offer that the low type prefers to war. The same is true for state two as the high type as well. We have a more interesting situation with the risk return trade-off. Here we can come up with parameters where there's no more risk and only return when we have cheap talk allowed. So in this situation, the low type again is going to announce that it wants a low offer. The high type is going to announce that it wants a high offer. What will happen is if the low type is announced, X1, state 1, is going to demand its own ideal point and state two is going to be perfectly happy to accept it. Now, if state two as the low type were to try to pretend to be the high type, it would receive an offer that's further to the right, but notice that any offer that uh, the high type is willing to accept is an offer that is worse for the low type than just simply getting the ideal point of state one. So the low type is unwilling to pretend to be the high type, and the high type, for similar reasons, is unwilling to pretend to be the low type. So we get full information revelation, and we get state one making an offer that is guaranteed to result in a peaceful outcome. Of course, this doesn't always work. Cheap talk will not always work, but there are situations where it does, and we see improvement and more peace resulting. So what did we do here? What are the takeaways from our paper? Well, we introduced a model of ideological conflict, and primarily we saw that cheap talk works in this environment. This helps us make a lot of sense out of what we see in diplomacy, where one guy is saying to another, hey, this is what we want, this is what we want, and we don't want that. And this model helps us explain why that sometimes actually works. Also, this model meshes very well with data. Recently, we've seen ideological estimation points or ideal point estimation in United Nations General Assembly voting, and this has a nice natural crossover with that data. In fact, uh, Peter and I, and also with another graduate student at the University of Rochester, Brad Smith, have been working on empirical models that relate to these sorts of theoretical models, and we're seeing good empirical support in the data when we run statistical analyses. And finally, this model is very easy to extend. Again, Peter and I, and also Brad Smith, again, another graduate student at the University of Rochester, have been extending this model in a bunch of different ways, and it's very useful. It's good to play with, and it's neat. So I hope you enjoyed this paper. I hope you check it out. You can find it again in the video description, and I hope to see you at the conference in Washington, D.C. Take care.